everyone and welcome to another video by Liminal Spaces. In this video I'm going to continue to talk about Roger Zelazny's Dream Master. Um, now if you're interested in just my general review of this book, uh, that go back to the last video uh, and that's just my general review. This video is specifically to go over in greater detail the plot of this novel because when I was finished reading it even though I enjoyed it thoroughly there was so much that I didn't understand and there was so much that I was confused about so much so that I went to the internet and tried to look up other people's reviews to see if anybody else got something that I did not um, and there was some good things that I learned but overall not a lot uh, not a lot of connections had been made. What I found was a lot of people had questions, like I did. Um, <clears throat> but one of the things that uh, a lot of people said uh, was that if you were to read the shorter version, which came out in this magazine, then it was a little bit easier to understand. So I decided to reread the novel, albeit in the shorter version. So first I read this, then I read this um, and the people that pointed to this were absolutely right uh, this was slightly easier to understand um, than this was but only because this one's a little bit longer and that kind of hides some of the important concepts within more and more prose. I'll get to that in a bit. Um, unlike This Immortal, which was originally a full-length novel that he had published in a magazine form, uh, and they abridged it. They abridged it very seriously to put it in that form. Unlike that, this one was complete. It was not abridged. Uh, and then he was asked to expand it, and it became this one. Uh, so that makes for an interesting concept. Uh, he probably felt it was complete in this form, but then wanted to release it as a novel, so was able to revisit it. Um, when I first finished the long one and started reading it in this one, I thought I was going to like this one better, but in the long run, I really do prefer the long one. Uh, and I'll explain why as we go through. So we're just going to dive right into it. I am going to, of course, major spoilers ahead. I am going to sweep through this novel step by step and outline my interpretation of what I think is going on. Um, because I took copious notes during the rereading of these. All right. So the book opens up with a very confusing scenario that is happening around the assassination of Caesar. And it seems that there are two people participating in the assassination that aren't necessarily part of historical events. And one of them keeps yelling that he wants to also be assassinated. Uh, and it's a very strange world we're thrown into because... Are we just, is this a historical novel that's going to tell us about the assassination? Or is this a sci-fi novel? And just about the time that all of that comes to a climax, we realize that we were, are actually in the office of uh, Dr. Charles Render. Actually, I don't know if they ever call him a doctor. We're in the office of Charles Render, who is a neuroparticipant therapist. And neuroparticipation is... Basically, they've created this machine that allows therapists to put their patients into a simulation of a world that the analysts control with their brain. So Render was creating this entire scenario of the assassination of Caesar in order to try and perform therapy on this politician and the the neuroparticipation 
is over. So they called neuro participation analysts shapers. So I'm going to call them shapers from here on out. Uh, these are people who shape worlds for therapy. Um, so the, the process ends. The egg machine that puts people in the simulation opens up. And the therapy can kind of commence the continuation of therapy. And basically what Render tells this politician is that he is terrified. The politician is terrified that he is going to be assassinated. But all the research Render has done and all the private detectives sh don't show any truth to this guy's paranoia that he's going to be assassinated. Uh, and the patient kind of gets angry and says, well, why would I think it if it wasn't true? Uh, and Render basically outlines or states for this patient that he is so average to people. Um, he makes so little of an impression that he doesn't have any really deep friendships or relationships with anybody. But he very much desires these. Uh, and his subconscious mind has tried so much to find the depth that it desires in relationships with people and it's failed over and over and over again. So now it is turning to the other most extreme and important relationship that we have with other people. And that is hate because his subconscious could not find depth in love. He tries to find depth in hate and that's why he, not only thinks everybody's trying to assassinate him, he actually subconsciously wants to be assassinated. And this is wild. And of course, the patient has a very hard time uh, taking this. I'm reminded of a time uh, many, many years back in my life. Uh, I have a very close friend group and we were all sitting out on my patio. Um, I think we were drinking some wine and chatting. And we got into a conversation that was basically each human individual can't see or comprehend their own flaws as easily as the people who love them can. Right? It's almost like we're blind to the things that are holding up or hurting us in our lives um, because we can't truly see our own weaknesses. Um, and we were all very close, so we came up with the, the bright idea of laying out our flaws to each other. Not us saying our own, but uh, everybody laying out what they thought our flaws were. Uh, we were just going to go around in a circle, and I happened to be first. And it was absolutely devastating. It was very strange and hard to deal with, and we decided very quickly that it wasn't an idea that we should continue with, so I was the only one uh, that got all this kind of laid on me, uh, and I was angry for months. Don't try this at home. Um... But eventually, it became very therapeutic because I was able to look at these things that I never even considered about myself and over time see them for what they actually were and slowly start to accept and then change them. It was really therapeutic, incredibly painful, and I feel like... This kind of therapy that this machine is able to do puts people in that situation. That's how incredibly crushing it is uh, to go through that type of therapy and have this your kind of flaws laid out to you so quickly. So that's what Render does. He kind of blows people's minds by 
making worlds that force his patients to confront terrible flaws and neuroses about themselves and then afterwards just lays it out for them. It's therapy on steroids and um, the science is very well described and really hallucinatory and almost psychedelic and that makes sense considering this was written in 1965. So next we get a little bit of uh, background on Charles Render, our main character, the Shaper. And he is able to shape. It's very rare to be able to be one of these types of therapists um, because he has a unique trauma in his past. His wife Ruth and his daughter Miranda died in a car accident that he was part of. Actually, I'm not sure he was part of. This is this was always very vague in the novel, uh, but. I think he was in the car, but he got out uh, and it, their car went into a, a lake uh, in a very, very cold time of the year um, and he was able to get out and they were not. Uh, and this trauma has locked up his emotions in such a way that he is able to resist the pull of other people's emotions when he's working on them. Uh, one of the things that the book makes clear throughout the entirety of it is that it's a very dangerous job to do this because he has to have control of the simulated world that is being created. And of course, it's his brain that is making this simulated world. Uh, but if he loses control and his patient is able to take control, it can spin been so quickly out of control, I feel like I said control way too many times there, uh, that, and that would take Render with his patient. So they never do this type of therapy on psychopaths, for instance, people that they consider so far gone into insanity uh, can pull the shaper down with them and within seconds uh, the shaper would suddenly have all of the same neuroses that his patient did so it's very dangerous work only a few people are able to do it and Charles Render is able to because of this trauma in his past and how it's made him push down uh, all these emotions he has a son named Peter that is away at school and he is dating a woman named Jill DeVille. That's not actually her name. I think they made that up um, because she's still married. He's dating a, a woman that's still married uh, and they don't really call her by her actual last name, which is her current husband's name. Uh, but she has no contact with her husband. She is absolutely 100% um, with Render. And he seems kind of obsessed with Peter's health. He's kind of a 1965 version uh, of a helicopter parent. So, after this session with the politician, uh, Render decides to go to his favorite restaurant and sit at his favorite table. And he's about to eat at this restaurant when one of the waiters comes up and says, Hey, there's a Dr. Shalot here. Uh, that would like to speak with you. And uh, he says, okay, send him over. And the guy says, well, circumstances make it better that you should go over to uh, to their table. And he's like, kind of heard about it because he got his favorite table and now he has to let it go. But he gets up out of curiosity and he walks over. And Dr. Shalott turns out to be a woman. Uh, of course, he automatically assumed that it was a man because this was written in 1965. Um, and a lot of those stereotypes are going to... Kind of that, that old-fashioned sexism is always hard. And I think Zelazny was a very forward-looking writer. But, of course, that's always going to be a part of these older science fiction books. Um, but, yeah, Dr. Shalott is a woman. Her name is Eileen Shalott. And she is blind. Before I get into 
the rest of that plot point, I want to stop for a minute because when I saw the name Shalot, I instantly thought of uh, Tennyson's The Lady of Shalot. So here is my copy of Tennyson's Complete Poetical Works. I like being able to bring these older things out of the antiquarian section of my library. This is the Cambridge edition of his complete works. And it was published in 1898. And on page 27, we see the poem, The Lady of Shalott. Now, I have read this poem before and studied it in uh, my undergrad years. So that's why I thought of this when I, I heard of her name, Shalott. And I pulled this out and reread it. And this is an awesome connection. And it's the first connection of many that Zelazny makes in this novel. And this is something that, uh, from what I've read, is a style of Zelazny's in the early novels, is that he very much likes to reference uh, older works or works that he's very familiar with, which I find very enjoyable. Some people don't like it as much, but I really, really enjoy it. Um, taking this detour while, while rereading uh, The Dream Master, I was able to read The Lady of Shalott again and see kind of the brilliance of why he chose this to be her name. So in The Lady of Shalott, um, we, we meet a woman who lives in a tower. And this is the time of King Arthur and his knights. And everybody wonders about this woman that lives in the tower and they say that she's cursed. And she, she stays in this tower and she weaves tapestries that show these beautiful landscapes and kind of her beautiful interpretations of what the world is. But she is cursed that she can't look out into the real world directly. Um, and if she does, that it will kill her. And that's what ends up happening in the poem. Uh, anybody that grew up watching the 80s Anne of Green Gables movies will remember that there's a moment where Anne and her friends reenact this poem and the dying of Lady of Shalott in the boat. But the way that it connects to this book is brilliant because Shalott is... Dr. Shalott is blind. She can't look upon the real world. Uh, and she wants to, we find out as the plot point continues, she speaks to Render and says, I would like to be a shaper. She wants to do the same job Render does, which means create worlds that aren't the real world, right? Tapestries. Um, so basically he's taken this character of Shalott and put her in a modern situation and made this sci-fi concept around this wonderful and beautiful old poem. It's really well done. Eileen is wearing a pin that is a goblet. It's a ruby, and it's in the shape of a goblet. But when you stare at it, it could be two faces looking at each other. It's kind of a popular illusion. I'll put it up here. Um, but this is the first mention we get of a goblet. And because of his connection to, that, that he's already made, his allusion to the Lady of Shalott, which is part of one of the Arthurian tales, right? King Arthur and all that. The Lady of Shalott falls in love with Lance a lot. Um, I started thinking that this goblet connected to the Holy Grail, but that is not correct. And I learned later uh, that it is connected to an Arthurian tale, but it is the tale of Tristan and Isolde, which we'll get to way later in the book. Uh, another thing that she mentions is that she has what is called a muti, um, which is a hound that has been genetically altered to be able to be much smarter and even talk a little bit. And this Muti is her seeing eye dog and his name is Sigmund. And when she brings this up at the dinner, of course, um, Render is very interested in this seeing eye dog because he's never at this point in his life met a Muti. There is a suit of armor uh, decoration right by the table 
that he meets her at. So when he walks over, there's this suit of armor standing there. It's another allusion to the Arthurian knight in shining armor concept. So she tells uh, Render that she'd like to be a shaper, and of course he responds with, well, unfortunately, given your situation of being born blind, it's going to make it impossible for you to be a shaper because you can't create worlds that you've never seen before. So how do you expect to do this? And she's like, you're right, they eat, um, they start drinking, and they decide to take this discussion somewhere else. And this is a really brilliant part of the novel because they... First off, all the cars in this world are self-driving, which is an incredibly fun scientific concept that Zelazny really looks at a lot throughout this novel. So all the cars are self-driving, and when you get in, there is a screen that shows you a map. Zelazny really looked forward well into the future. Uh, and you type in the coordinates of where you want to go. Very similar to our modern GPS systems. But people of this world have come up with a concept of blind spinning. And blind spinning is the concept of sitting in a self-driving car and tricking the system into putting in random coordinates so you have no idea where you're going to go. So your car just drives and you get to see places that you've never seen before. While he's talking about blind spinning and the self-driving cars, the narrative... Well, he brings... The narrative doesn't switch. That's not true. The point of view doesn't switch. But he brings up this comedian that is kind of like a voice in his head, right? That keeps making these kind of slight jokes about the self-driving cars that are funny, but also really on point. Um, but he introduces this concept of the comedian that he happened to see at one point that was talking about um, self-driving cars. And the introduction of this comedian becomes very important uh, later on, and we can talk about it um, when we come to that point. He also tries to convince her not to become a shaper by describing how truly dangerous it is, and we've already talked about that a little bit, but he brings up a case specifically where uh, he was dealing with somebody that was claustrophobic, and for one millisecond he lost control, and it left him with claustrophobia. So now he's go skiing as much as he can as kind of a therapeutic way to fight this claustrophobia that he received, not from his own neurosis, but from a patient's neurosis because he lost control for just well, a minute. Eileen pitches this concept that instead of teaching her how to shape, maybe he could bring her on as a patient um, and cure her of her sight anxiety, she calls it. She's a doctor, so she really doesn't need therapy, but she does need to be able to understand what everything looks like so that she can shape for other people. So she kind of creates a loophole that Render can't really resist because academically it's a really interesting idea. The concept of taking somebody who's blind and teaching them what, everybody, what everything looks like by shaping for them. So in the end, he ends up agreeing and decides that he's going to show her what it means to see so that eventually she can become a shaper. But he's going to do it with her as his patient. And on the books, he's going to be curing her of sight anxiety. The next morning, he comes into work and it turns out that throughout the night, a person had committed suicide in the building he works in. Uh, they had jumped from an upper window and actually hit the building at one point on the way down and left a mark near his window that he can see, and it really bothers him. And it turns out he has a speech to give at some kind of convention uh, the next week, uh, and so he starts practicing this speech. 
and what what comes after that is is really Zelazny breaking down and looking at the world that he's created for this uh, novel. And this is a world where overpopulation is a problem. The all the areas of land really possible have kind of become urban settlements, but technology has gone so far that everybody is able to have all their physical needs seen to. So what's happened is there's a world so physically comforted and so taken care of by technology that people have become isolated and lonely and disconnected. And that's created a lot of neuroses in a lot of people. And the suicide rates have kind of gone up because of this. And Render is is really taken by this suicide and decides he's going to start writing a paper about suicide and that becomes important throughout the rest of the story. Again, we'll get to why it's important later as we go through the plot. Later that afternoon, uh, they have their first session. Uh, Eileen brings Sigmund, her seeing eye dog that's a mutie, with her. And it's the first time that Render's met a mutie or uh, this specific dog, Sigmund. When he first sees Sigmund, he compares him to Fenrir, the antagonistic wolf god, uh, son of Loki from Norse mythology. They talk about it a lot in the Prose Edda, uh, which is a fantastic read. One of my favorite uh, early, uh, well, ancient literature books, although I don't know if this counts as ancient. I would love to find a uh, earlier hardbound or older copy, but I have not as of yet. Right away, Sigmund seems unhappy that she's doing this and a little bit afraid. Uh, he, he, when he talks, he just growls out words uh, and he doesn't seem to like this idea at all. Um, but Eileen just tells him, hey, go sit in a corner, stay there and don't bother us while we do this. She undresses and he describes her as absolutely stunningly perfect and beautiful. Uh, and we get the sense that he might start, might be starting to have some feelings for her. Um, even though, of course, he's still with, with Jill, uh, Jill DeVille. But there's a weird moment where he is simultaneously excited about her perfectness, but is also kind of put off by it. Uh, and he, the character Render himself describes this as maybe he's just unhappy that she's his patient. And if we take that a little bit farther, maybe he's unhappy that she's his patient and not his girlfriend or or something like that. Um, it's a very strange moment in the text, but anyway, she gets into the machine. And once she's in the machine and is unconscious and ready to have the simulated world created, um, Fen, or, uh, Sigmund keep wanting to call him Fenrir, uh, Sigmund comes over to Dr. Render and tells him not to do this. And Render's like, very nervous. The dog is terrifying. The way it's described in the text is brilliant. It's very scary. Um, and eventually Sigmund states that he's afraid if Render gives Eileen his eyesight that Sigmund won't be needed anymore. And it's very sad. Uh, eventually, uh, Render just says, hey, go sit in the corner like you were told. And this will be this will be over quick. And she will be exactly the same when we're done as when we started. She will leave with you in the lead. So they begin their first session. And this is one of the parts where this book really shines. There's no amount of describing this that's going to be able to really express how beautifully written this is. It's prose poetry. Um, it's vivid. He shows her colors first and then slowly creates a dark night scene so as not to shock her. Um, and this is the most hallucinatory, psychedelic, um, and really wonderful part of this book. 
He is very thoughtful in how he slowly gives her sight. And like I said, it's very hard to describe. This is the reason you should read this book. Uh, there's a lot of moments like this, and they're they're very beautiful. Um, one thing he does notice is that she has the ability to take little moments of control right off the bat. Uh, for instance, it takes her a minute to form herself on the lake of or on the shore of this lake, um, and she finally does, and then he forms. And he's forming himself for her to see him for the first time. And when he forms, he is in the armor that they sat next to at the table of the restaurant. But he didn't put himself in that. She did. Um, And of course, he's very aware of this kind of knight in shining armor position that she's put him in. uh, And instantly says, don't do that. Let me, let me do the shaping. You don't do the shaping. And he puts himself in his normal clothes. Later, she says she wants a cigarette and she picks the image of the cigarette from his mind and gives herself a cigarette. He doesn't shape her a cigarette. She is able to pick from his mind the image of a cigarette. And this kind of scares him and he warns her off of about doing that, that it's very dangerous for her to take control like that. Other than that, they have a very beautiful session, and she's able to see a lot of new things. After this first session, he continues working on his speech. So the first half of the the speech before the session talked about the world as it was this the world that he was li- that he lives in in this novel, um, and how it is able to give everybody what they need physically but mentally a lot of people are really lacking in the second uh section of the book where he's looking at the speech practicing the speech he starts looking at jungian concepts and really gets into the psychological um, aspect of the entirety of his civilization Uh, and he talks about the fact that when people look for states and values and aren't able to find them, we fall back onto our subconscious to find them. And when we still can't find values in our subconscious, we fall back onto the collective unconscious or the collective consciousness, I'm sorry. Um, And the collective consciousness goes back to myths and early religious concepts in order to create values. Uh, And that's what he feels like his society is doing. Again, we see Zelazny has a real connection to a lot of these uh, classical and ancient texts. He's interrupted by a call from his son's school. Peter has hurt his ankle, and this is where we really start to see him dealing with this past trauma or not dealing with it. It seems like it's just smushed down. But when it comes to his son, he's severely overprotective and he starts talking about the fact that he's probably going to move his son out of that school because he hurt his ankle in PE. Uh, Right after this, he opens a wall safe in his office and pulls out a necklace and a, uh, that his wife used to have and a picture of his family before his wife and daughter died. Uh, and he only allows himself to stare at that picture for a few seconds and then he puts it all away into the dark safe probably for quite a few months. Um, this is a very heavy scene and it shows how deeply this has affected him and how um, almost sacred he's made their memories Uh, So much so that he won't allow himself to look on it for very long. Um, It really kind of helps us define who Render is. Later, we see he and his girlfriend, Jill. We see me meet Jill for the first time, and they are at a robot dance. And the description of this robot dance and what the robots can do that people can't do in a regular dance is incredible. Again, very psychedelic, very strange. This is... This is why you should absolutely read this novel or for these passages. Uh, But during this robot dance, Jill calls out Render for being um, a little protective of her son. I mean, of his son. 
uh, and Render just kind of shuts it down and doesn't really want to talk about it. Uh, but on our first introduction to Jill, she seems like, well, they seem like they care about each other. Uh, they love each other. And Jill seems um, very fun. Like, a, like a, a, I mean, she seems like, I like the fact that she's a well-rounded character because, for instance, when he puts, when, when I'm sorry, for instance, when Eileen puts Render in the knight in shining armor outfit in the dream we have this connection to shallot again so the lady of shallot falls in love with sir lancelot lancelot is in love with sir guinevere so uh the lady of shallot can't, can't have lancelot so she basically dies trying to get to him and prove her love and we see a similar situation in which of course eileen is Shalot, her last name is Shalot, uh, and Jill becomes Guinevere, and he becomes Lancelot. Uh, so we have this setup for um, Eileen loving Render, but Render's love being elsewhere, and her sacrificing herself trying to prove her love, and this all becomes important as the novel goes on. But Jill is also a very well thought out character she's she's not just a caricature she's really well thought out uh and she has her own unique ideas and thoughts and uh she pre pre presents them to render and they seem to work well together and i'm glad that he did that because um it's a love triangle. There's a love triangle in this book, and it's not huge. It's not a major part of it. It actually is a major part of it, but it's not gone over a lot. It's it's further back through vagaries, but it is important to the text. So you start thinking of which relationship you think would work best for everybody involved. Um, and at this point, Jill seems to be the... The one and that's where we leave part one of this text and we jump into the second half of it i am going to to add really quickly uh that there is a moment here in this book that is not in the original shorter magazine version uh that is so good i believe you should read this book and not the magazine version um and that is there is an entire section told from the point of view of sigmund the seeing eye dog of eileen um, and we learn that sigmund has figured out how to get into the self-driving car and input coordinates so that he can go where he would like to go and in this chapter he goes out to the middle of nowhere uh gets out of the car runs into the forest and tries to reconnect with his canine genetics uh because sigmund's in a very sad place he feels like he's no longer a canine but he's also not a human. He's somewhere in between this concept of third culture, uh, which academics like to talk about. It's very, it's a very enjoyable character. Uh, and he goes and he meets this wild dog and they hunt and they have fun together. And then um, in a kind of a fit of anger, uh, Sigmund bites this dog on the shoulder and then very sadly returns home. Uh, it's it's really wonderful stuff, especially if you like the Sigmund character as much as I did. Uh, so that's why you need to read the actual expanded part, because the part Sigmund plays, plot-wise, is just the same in both of these, but you get this chapter from Sigmund, Sigmund's point of view, which is really worth it. It really is. So... Um, after this, we go, we, we snap to time has passed and Jill and Render are on a European vacation. We start in Winchester Cathedral uh, and 
Apparently, Jill has a hobby of loving architecture, so she's really enjoying this trip to Win uh, Winchester Cathedral, uh, and he's not so much into it. Uh, he doesn't really care about architecture as much as she does. Um, and he wants to go skiing, and she doesn't care about skiing at all. So we see that they don't have similar uh, hobbies. But he is suddenly and secretly very interested in, Win in Winchester Cathedral, and he's looking around trying to memorize every portion of it because he wants to bring it back and show it to Eileen. So we start to see that even when he's with Jill, he's thinking of Eileen, that maybe he is falling a little bit more in love with Eileen than Jill. After they have a few days of looking at different buildings in the architecture, they go skiing, I think to Sweden. Um, and he's relaxing in the lodge the first evening that they're there and looking into the fire and he sees the shape of a goblet. Again, we see this, this goblet which I initially associated with the Holy Grail, which is not the association I think this novel makes. But if, again, we'll get to that at the end of the novel. At the lodge, he runs into Professor Maurice Bartlemitz, and that's his old mentor, his old professor. Uh, and Jill falls asleep, and he and uh, um, Bartlemitz, Professor Bartlemitz, have a conversation and he tells his professor about his current exper experiments with Eileen. And his professor um, kind of freaks out and says, that's not what this machine is for. This is a really bad idea. And his professor tells him about a grad student named Pierre. And Pierre decided it would be a really incredible academic pursuit to hook an ape up to the machine and shape worlds for the ape to see so that maybe there could be some form of communication uh, and Pierre lost control of the experiment and the ape gained control and pulled Pierre in and, and made Pierre basically into an angry ape himself and he had to be institutionalized after that and he basically states that doing this with Eileen is very similar. And he says, and he breaks this down into some really interesting psychology using Buddhism. And I, there's a lot of words that I looked up and understood, but I'm not going to try to pronounce. I'll just make a, a, a mess of it. Basically, what he says is there is two egos. One ego is the e actual soul, the truest version of you possible um, and then there is an ego above that that is created by nurture by ideology right it's interesting it's it's putting nature and nurture together and allowing both to exist which i think makes a lot of sense so there's the you that's born then there's the you that's created the subconscious you that's created through ideology that ego and then the the consciousness is the surface um, and he creates a river analogy. So you have the surface of the water. That's where the conscience is. Also where neuroses are. He says neuroses are just ripples on this water. Underneath that is the ego that is created by nurture. That's the water, the depths of the water. Under the river bank, under the dirt of the river bank, is the actual human. Um, and he says that doing what he's doing with Eileen could crash directly against the actual ego of Eileen, the born ego of Eileen. She was born not seeing and he might accidentally show her something that opens a floodgate within Eileen that questions directly this core, this unchanging core of Eileen, and he and he describes it as such that suddenly the the riverbank would fall in and a whirlpool would form, uh, and he would be sucked under and instantly become 
just like Pierre, um, he would have to spend the rest of his life in an institution because of how insane this would drive him if this actually occurred. Uh, right after this, he says, this is not the case. She's already a therapist. Um, she knows what she's doing. I know what I'm doing and there's no problem. And then his professor says, let me ask you a couple questions then. Number one, has she shown any tendency towards OCD or a desire to see more or take control? And he has to admit that she has. He asks a couple other questions. I don't remember exactly what they are, but his final question is, is she beautiful? And this is an important moment because he's hinting at the concept that if Render is falling in love with her, the patient-doctor uh, relationship is being corroded and destroyed and that that makes it even more dangerous. But Render thinks everything is fine and decides not to deal with this. After this plot point, there's only really one other plot point in the book. Uh, and that's the very end of the book, which we'll get to in just a minute. But there's a lot between those two things. Uh, and the book kind of turns into this chaos of point of view. And it constantly changes point of view in ways that at times are incredibly difficult to follow. Uh, that I was only ever only able to really comprehend because of my second read through um for instance we go into jill's point of view right after uh he talks with his professor we go into jill's point of view and she receives a letter uh while they're at the ski uh at the while they're in sweden she gets a letter that uh, says her divorce is finalized and she's very excited about that um, and then we are suddenly in Sigmund's point of view for just a minute. And he's super worried about the stuff that's going on with Render. And then for one second, and this is so short, uh, we are in Pierre's point of view. Pierre is the person that his professor was talking about that did the shaping with the ape. So we just get this random small section where he's brought his food, he's in the asylum, he sniffs the food and really likes this head of lettuce and starts eating the head of lettuce. That's it. We never hear from Pierre again. And this is, a, a, a I think, a part of this novel that confuses everyone that reads it. Um, and this is, there's a part that isn't, that's in this, that isn't in these shorter ones, but I wanted to bring it up. And that is... We get a point of view for just a moment from a comedian who is failing. His career is failing because in this new world, technology makes it so that everybody can, can instantly hear uh, his set. So all the work he does on his set has to be done over and over again. Uh, this is something that happened with Steve Martin. It's interesting because Steve Martin toured uh, at the end of the 70s, the beginning of the 80s. He toured huge all over and made records. And we used to listen to the records all the time when we were kids. Uh, but after that, Steve Martin had a really hard time coming up with more material. And that's when he went into uh, movies it's difficult to come up with more material as an artist. It really is. And so we get this moment with this uh, suicidal comedian. And when I first read this, I had no idea. I was like, who, whose mind are we suddenly in? Uh, but when I read it through the second time, I realized that the first time we see this comedian is when Render is talking about self-driving cars at the beginning of the novel. And he says he once saw a comedian make a joke that's the introduction of this comedian that has three or four sections in this book uh, and a lot of what people asked in their reviews is who is this comedian what does this have to do with 
anything in this book? And the answer is nothing. And a little bit of something. Um, we find out later that Render is working on a paper about suicides. I know I already brought that up, that he's inspired to do it because of the suicide in the building. But we don't know that yet. That comes up a little later. Um, and I believe this is one of the case studies of suicides that he was looking at for his paper. That's how small something can be in this book for Zelazny to give it time in the narrative. Look at Pierre. Pierre had one mention from his professor and he literally gave him point of view time. Um, a lot of people have thought, well, is this comedian um, later in Render's life? What happens to Render? Uh, and it's, it's, it's much simpler than that. He has been reading and studying suicide cases. This is one of the cases. And he's just giving us more of that. You could, you could file it under world building. Zelazny was very interested in this world of people being physically taken care of, but emotionally falling apart, uh, which, in my opinion, is one of the most accurate looks at what the world was going to become. And here we are now. Uh, I think that that's becoming more and more accurate. Of course, it's there's still people starving and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but we are seeing technology isolate us more. And and I think that Zelazny was, was on to something with this. So it's a chaotic point of view mess. But with a tiny bit of work, we can figure out where each point of view is coming from. We also get a point of view from Eileen and... It seems that she is becoming addicted to seeing. Um, she's almost acting like she's in withdrawals because he's on his European vacation and she wants nothing more than to do another session. It's almost becoming obsessive for her. And Render calls her and says, Hey, I'm back. When do you want to do the next session? And she's in her brain, she's screaming tonight, 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 but she doesn't want Render to realize that she's becoming a little emotionally obsessive about it, which means Eileen knows that it's becoming problematic and she hides it from him purposely uh, and, and very calmly says, oh, how about tomorrow? And he says, that's great. I wanted to show you um, Winchester Cathedral. I brought back something wonderful to show you. Uh, and she's excited about that. So there's another shaping uh, session. Uh, Eileen, Render gets a little too excited and shows her way too much stimuli. Uh, and she freaks out. And in order to calm herself, she places Render back into the suit of armor. And again, he becomes her obsessive knight in shining armor. And he... Freaks out, changes back into his, his self and says, don't do this and ends the session. And Eileen says, well, weren't you going to show me the cathedral? And he says, not now. And he ends the session again. So we have the session, which, by the way, again, beautifully described. That's the reason you should read this book. Um, but right after this, we go back into crazy point of view hopping uh, and we get um, a little bit more from Sigmund. And we get a letter from uh, Peter, Render's son, that says he wants to join military and go out into space. And also, through this, Jill makes an appointment with Eileen. Uh, and that's strange. So Jill calls and says, yeah, I'd like to uh, schedule some time with Dr. Shalott. Uh, and we don't know why Jill is going to see um, Eileen. It's very strange. And last, we go back to Render's point of view, and he is wondering what it is that's starting to worry him about his sessions with Eileen. Um, and he decides that it's uh, that Eileen is simultaneously really intelligent, but also shows a bit of helplessness. And he wonders if he is attracted to that and decides that it's just transference. 
between the two of them shaping together. At which point, Sigmund shows up at his office and this scares him. So he puts some kind of um, shocking... I don't know exactly what it was. He puts something in his pocket that he can squirt at the dog. I think it's a liquid um, that will stun the dog um, because he's scared of Sigmund. But anyway, Sigmund comes into his office and says, something's wrong with Eileen. Did you break her? And and he's like, no, I didn't break her. And he's like, what's wrong with her? And, and the dog's like, she won't respond to me. I've tried talking to her. And she won't respond to me. I need you to come right now and take care of it. And he says, okay, I'll, I'll come right now. So he goes out. This is where he learns that Sigmund knows how to use the uh, the, the driverless cars. Um, so he jumps in and watches as the dog puts in the coordinates. And they go to Eileen's house. They get to Eileen's and she seems just fine. She just says, I was very tired. Uh, I... Uh, I fell asleep and I was just taking a nap and Render is worried that he probably went way too fast in the last session and he wonders why he's going so fast. And this kind of is the crux of the next entire section, the end climax of the novel. Um, Is he going too fast because he wants to? Because he's excited? Or is it because she wants to? Um, and he's wondering, is she that powerful and strong or is he just completely vulnerable and weak? And that is, like I said, the crux of everything. Who's in control of these sessions? This is where we find out that Render is writing about suicide. Uh, and there was a, a moment in the earlier point of view section I'm going to go back to for just a second uh, because this was the most asked question in reviews of this novel is what is going on with this. Do you remember the comedian I brought up earlier? Well, he, he, we have another point of view section. We have another section from his point of view and he climbs a tree and jumps onto a whole, one of the highways where all these um, cars, self-driven cars are. And he walks out into traffic and kills himself by getting hit by a self-driving car. And in the the longer novel, it's very confusing because we have, I think, three sections about this comedian uh, that end in his suicide with no where to put them in the narrative of Render and Eileen. Uh, And again, I'm going to say the answer is it doesn't fit into that narrative, except that he's writing about suicide and has probably been reading about that guy. Um, And it's more there for world building. It's more there to talk about the sadness that this society has Uh, Even though they're very well taken care of, they're all very sad and isolated. And I believe that this section is meant to show that. It's more world building than it is narrative pushing. So even though he's just been worried about who's controlling uh, these sessions, they decide right then that they're going to go into the machine that night. uh, Because he wants to show her Winchester Cathedral. And this is where we get the climax of this story. Sorry, my camera died, so I had to give it just a bit of charge. Um, So, yeah, the break that we've been expecting finally occurs in the climax of this story. Um, He overindulges her desire to see things, and she takes control and greedily wants to see as much as she can, and it becomes this kind of nightmare where she's controlling. Really, he's describing what it would be like if you opened your brain, your subconscious, and allowed somebody else to shove theirs in. It's the only way I can describe it. And of course, this isn't something that can occur. This is a fantasy. It's science fiction. But he does such a good job of kind of showing what that process is like. 
And he does it through real kind of psychedelic writing, but also through alluding to other stories in the past. Uh, I've talked a lot about the goblet in this story and that I thought it was linked to the Holy Grail, but it isn't. Eventually, right near the end of this novel, he yells for Isolde, and that is the hint that allows you to connect back and realize what so much of this story means. But because he saves it for the very last, you have to reread it to see all the illusions, which is what I had to do. Uh, and of course, we're talking about Tristan and uh, uh, Tristan and Isolde. And the version that I believe that he is referencing is that in Mallory. Uh, this is my 1866 three-volume edition of uh, the Mort d'Arthur by uh, Thomas Mallory, one of my favorite antiquarian books that I own. They are absolutely beautiful. Uh, one of these times I'm going to do a library tour, but I have so much that it's almost easier to break it down in this way where I just bring the, the stuff out when uh, I need to talk about it. But um, a huge chunk of this story is Trist Tristan and the Soul Day. Uh, and once we find that link... In this story, we're able to understand this kind of final hallucination, merging of subconsciouses that he goes through. Um, of course, Eileen probably walks away from this fine. She doesn't take in any of his. It's her broadcasting. And I can't even... I mean, except for the fact that she didn't warn him that she was becoming really addicted to these sessions, I can't really blame her. Uh, for this occurring either. It's not 100% her fault. But it really, of course, affects Render more than anything else. Um, so right away, when she breaks, the world has many moons. One of them is a red moon, which starts to represent the this button that he has to push in order to end this session. So I haven't really discussed how this machine works. There's an egg and then he has like what he calls a Medusa-like helmet. Um, and his arm is in a sling. I think it actually might be his right arm is in a sling. And there's buttons that he push pushes subconsciously. He doesn't know he's pushing them to control and shape the world with his brain. Uh, but there's a big red button a shiny red button that uh, if he pushes it ends the entire session which he keeps trying to push he's trying to save himself this entire time so this this button keeps showing up and he keeps trying to push it but he can never actually get to it uh, but right away Eileen appears to him holding a goblet and begging him to drink from this goblet. So, the story of Tristan and Isolde is... Um, Tristan is bringing Isolde to his brother-in-law... No, his uncle. Is bringing Isolde to his uh, uncle Mark to marry. But on the journey over the sea, uh, they have a love potion. And they both drink this love potion and fall in love. Uh, and in this version of the story, she is given the love potion for her and Mark, but she uses it on Tristan. So we see this moment where Tristan is trying to push this love potion. I mean, where Isolde is trying to push this love potion onto Tristan. Um, and Eileen is trying to do the same thing in his, in her consciousness. She's trying to force him to be the knight in shining armor that she sees him as. And he keeps rejecting it. And he keeps being chased. Um, Fenrir appears. Of course, this is what he thought Sigmund, thought of Sigmund. Fenrir, the wolf from Norse mythology, shows up and chases him until he comes upon the scene of the car crash where his wife and daughter died. And he comes across it at a point where the car has been pulled out of the lake 
and he is standing staring at the wreck and Fenrir runs past him and starts trying to chew on these corpses and he calls him Fenrir chewer of corpses I'm sure that has a connection in Norse mythology um but just going down the rabbit hole of Norse mythology that I did um was more than enough uh, research for that that moment um, and he basically starts yelling hey my dead are sacred you can't do this and he's talking to both Fenrir and of course Eileen although he has lost who he is at this moment he doesn't know who he is and finally Eileen shows up at this very weak moment and says drink this again the goblet with the love potion in it and he drinks it and falls in love with Eileen and also remembers who he is. Eileen is really trying to remind him that he is Render, uh, the Shaper. And he keeps forgetting who he is and becoming this knight again, uh, Tristan. And then a two-headed giant from Jewish Kabbalic lore... Um, shows up and I'm just I'm not going to try to say these words because I will destroy them um, if you're interested in each of these concepts they're just right at the very last page last couple of pages of the book this two-headed giant shows up and he tries to banish him to a place that from my research seems like hell um, but again this is all kind of Kabbalic concepts um, and the two-headed giant tells him no we're already in this place that's kind of like hell and he is at that moment given a choice a large pit opens up behind him which will drop him into hell but Eileen suddenly says, come this way, come this way, trying to save him. Trying, I think, I think Eileen is consciously trying to stop this damage from occurring. She keeps trying to remind him that he is Render the Shaper. Um, and is trying to get him to come to this cave. And I think it becomes a, a moment of truth where all the agency comes down to render and he has to choose to give in and allow himself to become insane while Eileen's conscious, uh, subconscious is smashed into his own and or go to the cave and hopefully find his way back to Charles Render the Shaper and be able to save himself. And he falls backwards into the abyss. Um, and allows her subconscious to merge with his. And of course, he goes insane. At that point, the narrative jumps and we are thrown to a point where the politician from the very beginning shows back up because after the very painful realizations that Render put him through, he's come to understand and realize how flawed he was and be able to work on those. And he feels like basically his life has been saved. So he comes back after hearing that Render has gone through this terrible, terrible time, hoping to somehow say a few words that can bring Render back. And he shows up and he's talking to somebody and they don't tell us who it is. It's just a person responding to him that says, you cannot talk to Render. Nothing you can do will save him. If you respect him and he really helped you like you say he did, then you need to leave him alone now. And then suddenly we go into what we can only assume is Render's head. And this was the hardest part for me to figure out. And the key is Tristan and Isolde. Um, uh, we're not seeing things through seeing things through his point of view. We're seeing from the things from the point of view of somebody named the Servitor, and we don't know who this is. But the Servitor um, very ominously starts this section with saying, "Okay, um, everything's beautiful in this world, but we need to end things." 
and it shows him go up into this tower and talk to a knight in shining armor that is bleeding and it took me a bit but then i i had to realize that this knight is render so we're in render's brain but we're not seeing things through render's point of view and render is completely stuck as this knight in his brain he's living in this fantasy world that uh, eileen and he created together through the concept of tristan and a soul day um and the servitor is all we can assume is another shaper trying to help render out of this world and we flash back to him talking with his professor on that ski trip and the last warning that his professor gives him is please don't go any farther this with this i don't want you to end up as a patient of mine and that is how we figure out who this person is inside render's mind it's his old professor trying to save him um, and even at one point they say that uh, this servitor the knight mentions the servitor has a very strong northern accent and of course this uh, professor was from Sweden so that's the the major hint that tells us um, who this person is all right my camera's died I'm gonna finish this up I don't want to charge the camera again um, the conservator says okay it's time to end this you need to know the truth and that is that a ship is coming and its sails are black and this relates again to the tristan and soul day story um at the end of his life tristan is is mortally wounded and he says the soul day is the only one that can fix him uh, at this point he is um married to another woman and he sends this guy out to get a soul day because she's the only one that can save him and, and says, hey, if you can get her when you're coming back, have the sails white. If you can't get her when you're coming back, have the sails black. In the myth, the his wife in jealousy um, makes it so that the person that's gone and gotten a soul day um, has the sails be black which means a soul day did not come but the truth is she is on the boat she did come and he sees the black sails and in sadness kills himself and that's the end of tristan um so the his professor is hoping to save him from this state he's in by finishing the story by making him see the black sails and killing himself it might have the same effect that we heard about earlier when they talked about that uh that patient that uh had a fantasy world and render broke it down and he was cured uh, he might be hoping the same thing but when render gets up to look at the ship he is able to take control of the shaping for a moment and the sails of the ship turn white which is not what his professor wanted he wanted the sails to be black so that he would kill himself and be done with this fake world but he render forces the sails to be uh, white and screams isolde you've come back for me you've come back for me and of course isolde to him is eileen and he thinks that she's coming back again but she is not uh and the conservator looks up into the sun who is which is bright red and it's a button and he reaches up and pushes that button and that's the last bit of the novel is his professor leaving the um shaping session because he wasn't able to save render this book was dark uh it was it didn't end happily but it was so beautifully written um so fun to read and honestly again the reason i read this was because of 
Haruki Murakami saying that this is what inspired him to write the science section of Hard Boiled Wonderland and the End of the World. And you can see it all throughout this book. Uh, Hard Boiled Wonderland is about, of course, somebody making a new subconscious and putting it into somebody else's. The connection to this book is obvious, even down to the way that at the end of Hard Boiled Wonderland, you are left with this hallucinogenic ending that you have to put the work in to try to symbolically figure out what happened. That's what happens in the uh, Zelazny one as well. I can't recommend this story enough. I hope this video has helped you uh, who are reading this or have just read this understand more what is going on with it. Uh, I do plan to read more Zelazny in the future, and I'm sad that he's not more well-known for this. Uh, I look forward to seeing what the Amber Chronicles are about um, because after reading this, I feel like they have to be they have to be pretty strong. And I know a lot of people swear by them, but there's also a lot of people that feel like Zelazny just wrote those to sell out, to make money. And, and I don't know what the truth is, uh, but I do hope to read them in the future to find out. Um, I think that for me, this book was just as, as challenging and enjoyable to read as Dune. And it did share the Hugo with Dune in 1966. And I wish that, that more people read this. Um, anyway, I hope this uh, helped with people that have read this and, and were confused by it. If you uh, um, like this video, please click like. If you like this kind of content, we're going to be making a lot more of it in the future. And thank you very much for watching this till the end.